Okay, um, we've stabilized at about 126 now, so I think we'll get started. Can I just confirm that everybody can hear me? Please, if you can't hear me, so if someone said yes, that's good. So I'll assume that everybody can definitely hear me. Thank you very much. Okay, um, in that case, we'll get going. Um, I'm Mike Smith, as you know from yesterday, um, and I'm going to be talking to you about metal forming. Um, we're moving on from what Marco has been doing, and we're now going to look at another manufacturing process. And met our metal forming course is going to form five lectures. So we've got lecture one today, which is a gentle, gentle introduction to metal forming. Um, just looking at what, what it is about, what sort of things you can do with it. No maths, uh, just a few videos, uh, which you can look at afterwards as well as during the lecture. Next week, we'll move on and we'll look at the stress strain behavior of materials, uh, which is a little bit of background information to help you to understand what goes on in a metal forming operation. And then we'll start looking at extrusion. Um, next Tuesday, we'll complete looking at extrusion. And then the following week, we've got two lectures, one on deep drawing one and the other deep drawing two. So that's a total of five lectures before we move on to looking at welding. Um, I'm going to be running a Zoom drop-in session on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. I won't do one uh, this week because we've just got the one lecture, but next week and the week after, I'll be sending round an invitation for a drop-in session on Zoom on Wednesday evening. So if you've got questions that weren't answered during the lectures themselves or in the uh, discussions, uh, the Blackboard discussion, then you can come and, and buttonhole me about it then. Um, we are, of course, still running the discussion board and there's a forming discussion board on Blackboard where I'd encourage you to post questions, because if you post them there, then the answer will be seen by everybody, uh, which uh, more than one of you might find helpful. Um, there's one tutorial that covers forming, and that's going to be on the 6th of May. Um, and one thing not to forget uh, is that the second assessment quiz is going to be on the 13th of May. OK, so that's the overview of the course. Um, this first lecture, we're going to first of all ask us ask the question, what is metal forming? And give us some answers to that. What's the process about? We're going to look at the ways in which you classify forming processes. You'll find they fit into families and there is several classifications you can use to see what they actually do. And then we're going to go through and look at four common for forming processes. We'll have a quick look at forging. We'll have a quick look at rolling and those we will only deal with today. We'll then introduce extrusion and deep drawing. But as you've seen from the syllabus, we'll be spending a little bit more time looking at them later on in the course. So that's the content of this course. And I mentioned before that I'm going to be showing some videos. Um, these are all on YouTube. Um, so what you'll get during the uh, lecture is actually me playing you a YouTube video and probably talking over it. Now, obviously, that's not the best resolution sometime. It's still useful to do because it helps to reinforce what we've been talking about just before the videos. But obviously, there will there'll be links to those videos in the lecture notes. And I'd encourage you to go and watch them in glorious high definition yourselves later uh, or when you go through the lectures at some future date. So that's what we're going to do today. So question one, what is metal forming and how does it differ from other manufacturing processes? Well, there's a definition. Metal forming process achieves a predetermined component shape by redistributing raw material under the action of applied forces. So it's not like machining, 
where you remove material. You start off with a block and you machine it down into a bracket or a flange or something like that and chuck a whole load of stuff in the, the, the scrap bin or the swarf bin to go off to be recycled. And it's not like additive manufacturing, where you add material steadily to build up a finished part. It's a shape changing process. You redistribute your raw material using forces um, and that gives you the final shape you want. Now, it takes all sorts of raw material. Um, you can use bars, you can use billets, you can use ingots, you can use sheet. You can use plate, which is not listed there. Um, and of course, these in turn will normally already have been produced by another manufacturing process, like a foundry or a rolling mill. So very often you'll have a whole sequence of processes that take place before you end up with a finished part. So you'll roll plate, which is a, a, a forming process. That plate may well then be um, forged, or if you roll it thin enough to sheet, it may well be deep drawn. What you're actually doing is doing a such a step by step process just to get from raw material to finished component. Uh, and there's often a mix, mix and match there as well. You may have machining as your final step. Uh, you may have heat treatments in amongst them. Um, and this bullet point is just saying the same thing again. Very often you'll have a cascade of forming processes that go from your original material to your finished component. And here there's a couple of examples. We'll come back to that picture later. That's um, a forged billet or bar. What we're doing there is reducing the diameter of something by alternately squashing it and rotating it um, to generate a shaft or something like that. And on the right, we've got a deep drawn sheet. There we start with a piece of sheet material and we basically squash it in a mold so that we can produce something which is more useful to us. That's some kind of bowl there. So that's metal forming. You redistribute raw material under the action of applied forces. Um, and as I said, you can start with all sorts of things. You can start with billets. Now, those have actually looked like they're cast billets in that picture. So there's a prior machining operation. You can cast something as the raw material for a subsequent forming operation. Here's bar. Now, that bar has probably already been extruded before you use it for something else. Um, you've got plate. That plate has probably been rolled before you'd use it for something else. And here we have sheet, and that sheet has definitely been rolled before you use it for something else. So here's a whole set of raw materials that will feed in to your forming process, and they all, all in some way, the output of a prior material processing step. So why bother? Why would you want to use forming? After all, you can 3D print everything nowadays. Why would you want to use a process that involves big hammers, high temperatures, expensive capital equipment, all the rest of it? Well, one of the reasons is that you can use a forming process to produce very close to your final shape with very little waste. So you can start out with a large forged billet and you can, without losing any of it, you can turn it into a shaft or a hollow solid of revolution, which you're going to use for a pressure vessel, something like that. In the simplest thing, a blacksmith uses forming to change the shape of your pieces of steel that he works on. And he can produce you, um, you know, wrought iron fencing and things like that. Um, the key thing is you're changing its shape with very little waste. The other thing that forming does is it can improve the metallurgy of your component. Um, as part of the forming process, the deformation that you're putting in, particularly if you're doing it at high temperature, can actually improve the microstructure of the metal that you're using. Um, and you end up with better mechanical properties at the end of the forming process than you had in your original casting or your original billet. 
Um, and that can have to often be very important. Um, and here's a, an example down the bottom here, where if you decided to replace that big forging operation on the right, uh, top right, with a machining operation where you just machined down the shaft, what you'd end up is a microstructure that's much less favorable to take the loads on the component. Um, and it, you can see the grain flow in those two components there. So not only does it have little wastage, it can also improve your mechanical properties as part of the manufacturing process. So that's why we might want to use forming. How do we classify them? Well, there's a number of ways of looking at this. Um, the first is, uh, well, as I said, there are three basic classifications. The first is whether it's a bulk deformation process or a sheet deformation process. In other words, what's your raw material? Do you start out with a lump or do you start out with something thin? Um, and um, you'll see that when we look at the differences between, say, extrusion and deep drawing. Um, do you do it hot or do you do it cold? Um, a lot of forming processes are done on metals when they're hot. And that's because they are more ductile then and they have lower strength, which means you can form them with less force. Uh, they're also less likely to crack or fracture when you do it at high temperature. And you've also got this corollary that you can actually be improving the microstructure at the same time when you're doing it hot because thermally activated processes go on that help you to do that. So there's hot versus cold. Cold processes, on the other hand, will often end up, well, first of all, you don't actually have to heat it up, which saves you money and makes it a less dangerous process. But also you tend to end up with a better surface finish, uh, less chance of surface corrosion and things like that if you do your forming process cold. Uh, and therefore, potentially, you might not need a final machining step to clean up the surface of your component if you can do a cold forming rather than a hot forming process. And finally, there's this thing called steady state versus non-steady state processes. Um, and that's, this has got a slide all of its own. Basically, if you watch the process and say you photographed it at two separate moments in time and compared the two photographs and the two images look the same, the process is said to be a steady state process. If the images are different, it's non-steady state. So let's unpack what that means. Rolling is a steady state process because if you stood there alongside those two blue rolls you can see on the screen and you watched what was going on, once it had got going and you'd fed your plate into the rolls, basically it would always look the same. The height of what was going out on the right would be the same, the height of what was going in on the left, the two grey bits would be the same, and it looks like everything is going on in a steady fashion. A contrast, of course, is forging. So closed die forging, which we'll talk about later, where you put a piece of metal in the die and you thump it. Its shape changes. Um, and you can see photo one, you've got a nice square billet. Photo two, you've got a nearly finished part. You've changed its shape. Um, but you've changed its shape in a non-steady state way. So rolling steady state, pretty well all the other um, deep drawing, sorry, not deep drawing, closed die forging, non-steady state. And any other process that we look at, you can say, yeah, that's steady state, that's non-steady state. Now, slightly over, slight oversimplification, but a useful classification. So what should, we, what should we think about as our common forming processes? Well, let's think about forging, rolling, extrusion, and deep drawing. And let's take them one at a time. So what we're going to do is we're introducing the first two uh, and then we're going to say everything we're going to say about those two in this lecture. Um, a very, very brief overview of extrusion and deep drawing and then 
we come back to them for a deeper dive in lectures two to five. Um, so let's start out with forging. Forging is probably the oldest metal forming process in existence. Um, open die forging, which is the simplest, uh, is a very, very or deceptively simple process. Uh, you compress the part between two flat surfaces or plans. So here's an example. What we're doing there is we're squashing that shaft. We've got a two platens up top and bottom, and we just squeeze it between them to change its shape. So that's open die forging. Um, and a blacksmith's hammer and anvil are simple examples of open die forging. And here we have a blacksmith making a knife using open die forging. He's got a hammer and he's got an anvil, that's his two platens, and he's progressively changing the shape of that. And you can see in both the pictures here, this is a hot process, um, and it's a hot non-steady state process. Um, he's progressively changing the shape to produce your final product. So you can see that open die forging is the one that goes back to the Bronze Age. Um, extrusion does not. Um, and as I've said already, you manipulate the part to achieve its final shape. So even though you've got a simple pair of platens or a simple hammer and anvil, by manipulating the part, you can create quite complicated shapes. And here's an example of a very large open die forging. You can see that man standing there. What we're doing there is we're gradually rotating that shaft a few degrees at a time and thumping it with the big between the big platens to reduce its diameter in stages. So that's open die forging, very simple. Closed die forging is slightly more sophisticated. Um, there you make a punch and a die or two dies and you use these to define the shape of the product. So here's a hammer forge. You've got a hammer with a punch on it and an anvil with a die on it. You put your workpiece in and you bang them down and it creates a final shape. So you can see that this sort of process is quite suited to mass production because every time you put a, a billet in there and you thump it, you come out with the same sort of thing in a sim sing single operation. Um, whereas the blacksmith, I'm sure you can do that, but everyone is slightly different and it's all highly skilled. So that is closed die forging. The shape of the product is defined by the punch and the die, or indeed maybe the two dies, if the shapes of the component is appropriate. Um, another way of looking at this is when it's closed die forging, which we also call impression forging. You can see here, it's not really a hammer and a uh, an anvil, as it were, it's two dies, and you're squeezing it down to produce a shape. And what's going on here, what we want to look at is what happens as you squash it down. You can see you start on the left with the starting work pack part, you start to squash it, and you find it bulges, and then as the upper die and the lower die come together, so you start to squeeze material out between the two dies, and that we call flash. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a good reason for having flash there. Um, you, and it is to do with getting the shape right. So flash is forming around the punch die or the two die um, interface during step three above. And what's going on is that when you start to squeeze material into that small gap, then it's trying to move out against friction, uh, which means that pushing it becomes harder and harder. It's also uh, work hardening more because you're squeezing it more. But the key message is that the friction that's resisting squeezing that out means that 
it actually becomes more and more difficult to force material out that way, which means the easiest thing to do is to ensure that the remaining material fully fills the cavity. So the flash is there to make sure that you end up fully filling the cavity and getting the shape of your component exactly right. Uh, if you underfilled that space and formed no flash, then you'd end up with a component that wasn't quite the right shape. It hasn't quite expanded to fill the dies. Now, obviously, you have to remove the flash afterwards, uh, which is another machine, another operation, usually machining. But the key thing is that you need the flash and the frictional resistance thereof to make sure that closed die forging works. So that's a little bit on closed die forging. Um, as I said, the flash has to be trimmed away at the end. So what I'm going to try and do now is show you a video. Um, and we're going to swap the... No, let me swap the share. Yep, there we go. So as I said before, all these videos are on YouTube, but it is actually useful just to watch what people have produced to give you a feeling for how the operation works. So this is this is going to show you open and closed die forging. I won't talk over the American commentary, but I may stop it every now and again to make a comment. So hopefully- Use of compressive forces. These forces are applied through tools and dies, driven mainly by hammers, which deform the workpiece by high velocity impact, or presses, which deform the workpiece through controlled high pressures. Forging is one of the oldest metalworking processes, dating as far back as 8000 BC. It is utilized today to reduce the cross section, improve the metallurgical microstructure, provide directional grain flow, and eliminate porosity of cast ingot in fabricating rock mill forms, and to form discrete parts to near net shape from these rock mill forms, further refining microstructure and directional grain flow. Because of these effects on microstructure and grain flow, the mechanical performance of rock mill forms and parts is typically superior to that of cast metals. Open die forging is performed on ingot, billet, bar, or a preform, and is the deformation of a workpiece between flat or shaped dies without completely restricting metal flow. This deformation can result in lengthening of the workpiece while reducing its cross-section, upsetting regions along the length to greater sizes than adjacent regions or bulging the workpiece's cross-section while reducing its length. Lengthening and upsetting are typically done using multiple impacts as the workpiece is incrementally advanced lengthwise and rotated about its longitudinal axis. There is essentially no limit to the size of forgings that can be made using open die forging. They can range from a few centimeters to 30 meters in length and weigh from a few to up to several hundred thousand kilograms. Although fairly complex shapes can be made using open die forging, most are rather simple solids or hollows requiring considerable machining to achieve final shape. Forgings are produced using simple flat, V-shaped, or semi-round dies. Various accessory tools are also used, including saddles, blocks, rings, mandrels, and punches. To withstand forging temperatures, abrasion, and impact, dies and accessory tools are usually made of hot work tool steels or medium carbon alloy steels. Impression die forging, also called closed die forging, is the deformation of metal at forging temperature within one or more die impressions or cavities. It is performed both in presses and hammers. 
Work pieces may be round or rectangular in cross section or flat discs. And the dies are sometimes integrally heated to minimize chilling and cooling of the workpiece. For simple shapes, impression die forging can be performed in a single press stroke. More often, however, several strokes of different force are used with dies having several impressions for sequential preforming and finish forging operations. Preforming operations may include edging to increase the workpiece cross-section, blocking to refine the shape for finish forging, and finish forging to complete the shape. In finish forging, the bulk of the metal is forced into the impression, while a thin layer, called flash, flows out between the dies at the parting plane surrounding the forging. Flash comprises a flat region called the land, and sometimes a bulbous region at the end of the land created by a gutter in the upper die. The thin flash cools rapidly, increasing pressure within the impression, which assists metal flow in the impression details. Once finished forging is complete, the flash is removed either manually or with trimming dies. Right, let me just swap that. Back. So hopefully that actually came across. It's a useful video. Uh, it covered pretty well everything I said, but if it was a bit fuzzy, please have a look at it after the lecture. Um, so that is all we're going to say about that particular process. Uh, we're now going to move on and have a think about rolling. Um, first of all, we're going to start Stop. Sorry about that. I had the next video all ready to go. Um, so rolling. Um, there's a, you saw that diagram on the right of the top right of the two blue rolls and the sheet or plate being pulled out between it. Um, basically in rolling, you're using the process to elongate the metal plastically as it passes between the rolls. So you start out with a relatively thick plate or sheet and you're reducing its thickness. Um, and because you're reducing its thickness and because you have to conserve the total volume of the material, um, the exit speed of the metal from the rolls is higher than the entry speed. Basically, otherwise, you can't get all the material through. Um, so for a constant strip width, which is a reasonable pro uh, approximation for rolling, the product of the entry velocity and the entry thickness is the same as the product of the exit velocity and the exit thickness. And that's just another way of saying what goes in has to come out. Um, and the, the lower diagram is, is showing you the same kind of thing there. Now, that means that the strip is moving slower than the rolls are on entry and faster than the rolls on exit. Uh, and the frictional forces vary through the gap. Now, without friction, rolling wouldn't work because that you need friction forces to pull the strip through. If you had a perfectly frictionless set of rolls, it wouldn't work. Um, so rolling is used to reduce the thickness of plate material and sheet material. Um, now there are complications because uh, people prefer to use small diameter rolls because small diameter rolls reduce the loads that you need to apply to a given uh, plate in order or plate or sheet in order to roll it down to what you want. Um, now unfortunately if the rolls aren't very large diameter they're also not very stiff which means they'll deflect more under the very considerable loads induced during rolling. And that means you can't control the thickness of your sheet very well. So what we do is we put backing rolls on. 
So you end up with a situation where you have a whole series of stacked rolls. So you can see there's one there called a four high mill. You've got two small diameter rolls that actually contact the sheet as it goes through or the strip as it goes through. But you've got some couple of thicker ones in contact with them, which are acting as elastic supports to stop them deflecting. And then this thing on the right called a cluster mill, you can get really quite complicated if you want to, in order to reduce the load you need to roll the system, roll the strip, um, because that will actually save you money in the long run as well. Uh, but not to have excessive deflection, which means you can produce much more accurate uh, thickness strip. And here's a picture of a cluster mill that's partially dismantled. Um, quite sophisticated piece of equipment. Um, we've got a rolling video to look at, which I will start up in an appropriate fashion, um, showing basically all of this kind of thing. Um, let's go and move on to that one. Share, and we're going to look at this one and we're going to have a look at rolling. So if you can see that, hopefully it will work. Steel is highly resistant to shaping when it's cold, and for that reason, it is generally rolled whilst it's hot. To make sure the steel is at the correct temperature for rolling, it is fed into a furnace. Here it travels through several temperature control zones until it's at the correct temperature and ready for rolling. Whatever the product, the principles of hot rolling are the same. Steel is squeezed between rolls until the final thickness and shape are achieved. To do this, the rolls must exert forces of tens of millions of newtons, equivalent to a weight of thousands of tons. The rolls, therefore, run in massive bearings, mounted in housings of enormous strength and driven by powerful electric motors. These are known as mill stands. The layout of a rolling mill can vary from a simple single stand mill to several stands positioned either side by side or in a line. The mill rolls themselves can either be plain for flat products such as strip, used for products such as cladding, or profile for sections, beams and columns for use in construction. Mill stands have various roll arrangements depending on the product being rolled. The simplest arrangement is a too high stand, used mainly for long products such as sections. For light sections and bars, three high stands are sometimes used, with the steel passing one way through the bottom gap and back through the top gap. Four high stands have two work rolls in contact with the steel, supported by larger backup rolls to prevent distortion caused by the rolling face. These give greater accuracy for rolling flat products, such as plate. Universal beam mills include stands with both horizontal and vertical rolls bearing on the steel simultaneously. Rolling processes are computer controlled and monitored up to 50 times per second. Despite the huge scale of some mills, accuracy to plus or minus 50 microns can be measured. The rolled steel is then cooled in a way appropriate to its end use and prepared for further processing or dispatch. Right, that's that one. Let's flip back. Okay, so that's rolling. Uh, again, I, I hope you were able to see that. We won't be saying any more about rolling in this course, but I, as you can see, it's a very important process uh, for producing steels for all sorts of uses. Um, now we're going to move on and introduce extrusion. Um, here, what you're doing is you start out with a billet and what you, you then extrude it, you push it through a die that changes its shape. So the picture I've got there 
is what we call direct extrusion. So we've got a chamber with a die at the end of it. You put a billet on the upstream and you push it through with a ram. So you're pushing the material on the right out through the die and the die changes its shape to be the shape that you actually want. And that particular picture there is showing direct extrusion where the ram and the extrude are moving in the same direction. Uh, so you're pushing the extrude out in the same direction the ram is going in. You've also got what's called indirect or reversed extrusion. And in that case, you can see you've got a die in this lower one. You've got a blue die uh, mounted at the end of the ram and the ram is hollow and you you've got a blind um, container which you've got the billet in the red billet and when you push the ram in the extrude comes out in the other direction now we'll talk a little bit more about why you might choose these two different sorts of extrusion but those are the two basic classes of extrusion and uh, extrusion equipment can be large uh, that's a photo of a press for making aluminium extrusions and those are the products. Those are all aluminium extrusions. They've all been pushed out through dies. Um, so it's a very, very common process for generating long, long components with complex shapes. So basically, if you can push that out through a die and you want that shape all the way along a component, then extrusion is the way to go. Um, and I've got one extrusion video to show you because we're going to be talking about extrusion an awful lot more in the next two lectures. And this will be showing you titanium extrusion. So let me swap to the video and get it going. Well, let's actually get it back to the beginning and get it going. There you can see some extrude shapes. Those are the dies that they're going to use to make things. That's the raw billet that's going to be used to extrude through the dies. And in this case, it's a hot extrusion process. it goes into the chamber and out comes the extrude at the other end. So that's extruded T-sections. which look like they need a little bit of straightening. So here we've got a whole load of different extrude sections, I think probably all in titanium. Okay. Yeah, and on they go. probably don't want to watch it going into a packing case. So if we stop that there and switch back. Okay, so hopefully you can see the presentation again now. Um, the final process which we'll be looking at is deep drawing. Um, and in deep drawing, if we look at that picture on the right, you take a relatively thin blank, and you can see there's a blank there. It's often a disc of steel sheet or strip, 
which of course will previously have been formed. It sits on top of a die, it's clamped by a blank holder, and then a punch is pushed down to create a fairly deep drawn shape. So uh, th that's a relatively conceptually simple thing you can see there. Um, and typically you'll be looking at com uh, things like that. Uh, if a stainless steel sink, for instance, should you look in a kitchen ever, is likely to have been deep drawn. Um, and you can see all sorts of trays, there's a double sink there, all sorts of components where you want it to be deep and thin walled. Um, so that's deep drawing. And again, deep drawing has some fairly hefty kit associated with it. And the last thing in this lecture, we're going to look at, there's a couple of videos. I think we'll probably only look at one of them. Um, so let's see which one we fancy. Let's try this one. So we're going to make a frying pan using deep drawing, apparently. So if I switch to the video um, and start this up, what you can see, let's skip the trial and skip the ad. Start that at the beginning. So what you can see there is a thin piece of, uh, that's our blank, it's very thin, it's been cut from steel strips, they put it on the die and then the blank holder comes down and clamps it and then you draw it and in fact that's potentially the other way up. When it comes out you've produced a bowl, you can see it's got a flange around the edge. So he's very pleased with that. It's quite a nice, this is a cold process, it's quite a nice surface finish. That's his next one. And that's his finished one. And they're gonna, no, no, they're not, they're not gonna show you anything else. Right, let's stop that there. Um, so let's switch back and in fact, we need to stop the share. So let's kill that. Um, so that, I hope you found that helpful. That is a brief introduction to forming processes. So I said, we're gonna go and look at a little bit, in a little bit more detail at two of them in the remaining four lectures with sad to say some maths to do but that was intended to give you an idea of the sorts of things that these processes do and how they work. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, then please do. Um, either stick your hand up or shout out. Uh, I know we've got something like a hundred of us in here, so I can't see everybody's screen at once. So have you got any questions about that material? All as clear as mud by the sound of it. Um, oh, Alex, Alex Navarro has a question. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, I had a question. Uh, when will the recording be available or the uh, PowerPoint? Are you going to make them available? The, uh, the PowerPoint should be available already. Um, and the recording will be available shortly after the lecture. So okay. we're, we're recording the lecture live, which is what Marco did for, with all of his. So okay. as soon as the lecture's finished, um, we will upload it to the portal. So it'll appear a little bit later this evening, but you should be able to see the presentation slides already. Right. Okay, I'll check now. Thank you so much. Uh, Tian Yang. Hi, sir. Could you explain um, the difference between steady state and non-steady state again? Yeah, yeah, that's a complex one. So non-steady state is easy 
because if you've got something like a, uh, a closed eye forging, uh, if you look at it when you've just put the billet in, then you have a square billet. If you look at it once you've thumped it, you have a non-square component. If you stood alongside a rolling mill, um, yeah. when the, the rolls are turning, then the strip would be being continuously fed in on the left hand side and continuously fed out on the right hand side. So even though the, the strip is moving, if you look at the rolls and the strip on either side, it appears that it's a steady state process. So the forces aren't changing. The speed of the rolls isn't changing. The exit speed of the strip isn't changing and the entry speed of the trip strip isn't changing. So as you're looking at it, although clearly it is dynamic, it doesn't look any different at any two points until the end of the process when the strip whips through and it's gone. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Balint. Hi, sir. Could you please explain why we would like to have small rollers and not big rollers? Um, basically because the forces in the, the forces you need to impose on the rolls to compress the strip by a certain amount are smaller for small rolls than large rolls. Um, now I wouldn't like to try and derive that in front of you. Um, you might want to look in one of the re recommended textbooks to see if anybody's done some maths on rolling. But it basically comes down to the rolling forces are lower for a smaller diameter roll. But because the small because the the roll itself is smaller, it will deflect more um, because it's a beam um, held between two bearings. So that's not a derivation for you. This is almost a take on trust. But if you wanted to do some research on that, check in the textbook that we've recommended and see if there is a description of the force balance, which is quite complex on a rolling mill. Thank you very much, sir. It was perfectly fine to me. Okay. Uh, right. So, um, Shalom, are you waiting? Hi, sir. Um, with the rollers, they go, the speed, the speed that it goes in and the speed that it goes out stay constant, right? Uh, they're both constant, but they're different. Right. Yeah, because the exit speed is much higher than the entry speed. And the reason for that is because the thickness of the plate has gone down. So in order to actually feed the same volume of material out of the is exit. That, is that like a, is that a volume flow or mass flow? Effectively? It's both because you're not changing either the mass or the volume. Uh, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like fluid mechanics. Um, is that so? Do we say is that so? The thick, assuming it's got a constant cross section. A constant yeah, because side most, cross section. That's right, because when you're rolling strip, um, you know, the, basically, you what you you will obviously there will be a tiny bit of expansion, but you've probably got something on the rolls to stop it expanding very much. So most of the difference in height is accommodated by the difference in length. Because what you're actually trying to do is to make it thinner and longer, normally. And, and that's why our QAV can effectively go to, um, instead it goes to TV as in thickness times the velocity is constant. Effectively, yes, that's right. Yeah, thickness times velocity is constant because the width is, is constant. It, it's, down, it's just down to mass and volume conservation. Does that apply as well in while it's in between the rolls? Yes. Yes, because, it, you know, it, it, it's basically the atoms all have to get through there. Um, so the speed will steadily increase as the thickness decreases. Well, um, the well the th if it's because it's the rollers are circular, um, circular, won't it kind of won't it decrease as in the overall will, will be the same linearly? But won't they both be um, square terms or something? Because not sure what the terms are, but what you actually find is that the the relative slip direction between the roller and the uh, the strip is different as you roll around because the roller is moving at a constant speed, 
and it's a constant angular velocity. So as the as the strip is going in, it's being dragged in because it's actually moving slower than the roller. But by the time it comes out, it's moving faster than the roller. Um, right. But its thickness, as its thickness varies with position, yeah. Um, along the process that when it's going into the roller, it's got, as it started, it's got its original thickness, and then as yeah. you've pushed it through the roller, that's kind of it's getting like the gradient of the way it's going would be like a curve, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, because it's following the profile of the gap between the rollers. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, sorry, Alex, have you got another question or is your hand still up? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, could you uh, go uh, a bit more in detail with the hot and cold processes, like the difference between them? I didn't quite get it. Uh, okay, so, uh, I mean, you'll have seen with the videos and the pictures that some processes happen hot and some cold. Um, now, a lot of metal forming is done hot, and the reason it's done hot is because the strength of the material is lower, which means you have to apply less force to deform it. Its ductility, in other words, how much strain you can put into it before it breaks, is much, much higher. So you can, you can actually change its shape a very great deal before it fractures. Um, and also, because the fact that you're doing it at very high temperatures means thermally activated microstructural processes can go on as well, uh, which you sometimes want. So those would be reasons for doing it hot. Um, and the microstructures, does that mean that it has like a, the uniform grain structure? Like, so it, yeah, well, it depends more... on what temperature you're running at, um, because you, I don't know how much you've done in terms of materials. Uh, but there are one of the features of forging is that because you're changing the shape, you can effectively redistribute and deform casting segregates and things like that, which is a good thing. Okay. Um, if you're, you're at a high enough temperature, you can generate recrystallization where um, by putting work into the component, you're putting energy in. Right, and yeah. eventually it recrystallizes, so you end up with a new and more uniform fine grain structure. So better, I, like it's not, it's le like more, it's less anisotropic. Basically. It will that will be less anisotropic. That's yeah. right. Yeah, if it recrystallizes, it will be less anisotropic. Sometimes you want the anisotropy because actually the fact that you're the, the, the fact that you've generating some anisotropy is good because of the way the component, the final component is right. moved. Right, yeah. Um, but it'll all depend upon the end use and what temperature you do it at. And for cold, the reason for doing stuff cold, well, one, of course, is that it means you haven't got to heat the press uh, or the rollers, which means it's a much less dangerous and expensive process. Um, so you saw those guys who are running the, the uh, deep drawing press uh, I'm not, I think they may have had gloves on, but I wouldn't have bet on it. Um, in fact, uh, if you do go through watching forming videos, a lot of the ones that come from newly industrialized countries, there doesn't seem to be much health and safety going on. But clearly cold processes are easier because you haven't got the energy and the risks involved in making something hot. Yeah. And you've also got you don't tend to get corrosion and oxidation on the surface to any great extent if you do it cold. Uh, so you'll get a better surface finish. The downside, of course, is the material's got to be amenable to the deformation you want to put on, into it at room temperature. And since it's so hard to mold. It, it gets, you know, they have a higher strength and a lower yeah. ductility at, at room temperature. So you may find you can't deform it as much. And then it's a trade off yeah. between I want to do it cold, therefore I'll have to think about how to solve that problem as opposed to be I'll do it hot because that solves other problems for me. And I I, I can get, I mean, do some materials, uh, it's basically unviable to do them like as in with a cold process. It is sometimes, yes, but when we come to deep drawing, you'll find that you can actually do it as a multi-stage process where you heat treat the material in between stages to right. so remove all the work hardening and allow you to carry on doing it. It was I was wondering about that when like yeah. you stretch the material when it's so thin 
how could it that work with like long strains in a cold process well, that, i think that's a watch this space because we'll be talking about that when we do the deep drawing lectures okay great thank you so much okay thanks right any other questions right okay good um so yes what you'll find is that the the video should go up later on today uh, if you can't see the lecture notes contact me um now i've just had another note so could i upload the lecture notes so let me just log into blackboard and find out whether they are visible because they should be visible just bear with me Now, this could take a while, unfortunately, because I couldn't get into Blackboard this morning. And it's still running very slow. Um, so, no, that's not going to happen, sadly. So what we'll do is I'll, we'll check when we upload the video. We'll check to make sure that the lecture notes are available. They should have been available from this morning. Um, it's possible we got the, the release date wrong. Uh, but at the moment, sadly, the university login sys service won't let me in. Um, so I can, I can what, what we can do is if we turn, when we end the lecture, we'll check up and find out what's going on and make sure you can see everything. OK, Grigori. Uh, hi, sir. I got a question. So um, how does a T-bar get straightened after it's sort of pushed out of the die and it's kind of bent? Well, you you saw those guys in the video. They were putting it into a effectively a press and straighten it with further plastic deformation. So they were probably cold rolling it, to be honest, to straighten it out. So so what you've got is a you you've extruded it to get the basic shape, and then you put it into another process to straighten it out. Um, Obviously, you can hit it with a hammer as well, if you wish. Uh, it all depends upon the accuracy and reproducibility of the process you want to use. Um, uh, all right, fair enough, thank you. OK, right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we'll stop the session now. Um, let me stop the recording. And